in, are you in room one? Room one. This way. You go that direction. Okay, is that, that's on. Good deal. So tonight we have a, a guest speaker, a special speaker. Um, we have been supporting the Church of Christ India Fund uh, for several years now. And way back in the beginning, I don't know if you remember, but Dean Crutchfield came and spoke to us. And since then, Dale Foster has been a part of that work. And we are probably most familiar with Dale and his trips to India. Tonight we have... David Nance, who's actually taken over the work and is, is in, in charge of the work, who's here to talk about that with us and to give us a report on what's going on, an update on what's happening, and I think a couple of opportunities for us. And so we're glad to have him here uh, with us tonight. David has been involved in ministry, I think, more than 30 years. You got your um, undergraduate at Memphis School of Preaching and then went on to Harding to do a master's and then Southern Christian to do his doctorate work. So uh, he has invested a lot to be uh, in ministry and to do that. And so I am I am thrilled to hear that he's involved with uh, the India mission that, that we support and glad to have him here tonight. This is the first time he's been here, so don't embarrass me um, and be, be nice. No, uh, but we are glad to have him. So I will turn it over to David. Am I on? Testing one, two. You can, okay, good deal. <clears throat> if it's all right with you, um, I'd like to kind of conduct this as a little bit of a class. So if at any point in time you have a question, a comment, uh, an idea, something you'd like to uh, say, then we'll turn the conversation in that direction for a few minutes. Is that all right with you all? Okay, good deal. I appreciate very much you allowing me to be here, inviting me. Uh, well, I actually invited myself. I called up and said, hey, can I? But uh, anyway, uh, I appreciate the uh, commitment that you have for the Lord's work. I appreciate the commitment you've had for the India work, particularly for all these years. Uh, one of the reasons I want to be able to answer back and forth and, and like a class is because I know you've been involved with it for a long time, so there are obviously things that are maybe in your mind that uh, I may not address. Now, uh, <clears throat> This flyer here is about a uh, new project that we're starting. I'm not going to talk a lot about that, uh, but I, do, I would like you to take that home and, and read about it, pray about it, and, and, and so on. Uh, just to begin with, are there any questions anybody has? Okay, well, uh, you know, my name is Dave Nance. I live in a place called Covington, Tennessee, which is the next county north of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I lived there because that's where my wife was born and raised. My own self, I was uh, born in Lubbock, Texas, and my dad, uh, on his side of the family, are uh, Texans from back seven generations, before the Civil War even. Uh, most of them around DeSoto and Dallas and Fort Worth, uh, you know, all those, those years ago. Well, well, maybe not centuries, but, you know, a long time. So, uh, but Dad got a job with IBM, and if you've ever uh, talked to anybody on the inside of that company, we always called it, I've been moved, and we were, absolutely so. So we moved from Lubbock to Dallas, from Dallas to Los Angeles, Los Angeles to upstate New York, uh, from Poughkeepsie, New York, down to Raleigh, North Carolina. That's where I graduated high school. Then I joined the Air Force. The Air Force moved me to San Antonio for a little while, then to Biloxi, Mississippi, then to Hampton, Virginia, on the southeast coast there, uh, Norfolk, that area, Langley Air Force Base. They turned me into an air traffic controller, but I met someone there who taught me the gospel. And so I was baptized into Christ on July the 7th, 1976. Any of you all remember the date you were uh, baptized? Okay, a few, yeah, good date. Better than the birthday. <laughs> well, I met a guy there, a, a single young man who graduated from the Memphis School of Preaching and moved uh, to that area, uh, named Michael, Michael Hughes. And uh, Michael suggested to me that I might need to consider 
becoming a gospel preacher. He talked to me about the parable of the talents and said maybe you have the ability to do this. And since you might have the ability, you seem to, I, I think you have the obligation to try. And so I kind of felt the same way then. I feel the same way now. And so I tried, and well, I'll just leave it to you all to see how it's worked out. But uh, anyway, I went to the School of Preaching in Memphis, graduated in 1980, January. I started doing my ministry work with uh, small mission congregations in South Georgia and in South Florida. And it was during those years that I continued my education, took two uh, degrees from Harding, one in biblical languages, one in church history, and then continued and finally took a degree, a doctoral degree in church growth studies in 1996. That was when I started doing overseas mission work. I began to work with the churches in Ghana, West Africa. Any of you all familiar with that, that area? Okay. In 2007, this guy, Michael, that I mentioned to you, we'd been friends all these years, uh, he suggested to me, he says, listen, we need to go to India. He'd been doing that for a long time. Well, church growth is my, my study, it's my passion, it's, it's what I've uh, you know, always been focusing on for years. And so I knew the statistics, I knew, you know, but you know, somehow things, those statistics, when they talk to you about India, it's just like, oh, yeah, I know that's, I know nobody's lying, but you know, how can that be? When I went to India in 2007, well, I have never been back to Africa since. And it's not got anything to do with the African work itself. It's just that when I saw the work in India, my jaw dropped. The half had not been told, as the Queen of Sheba said to Solomon. It was just incredible. So I've been doing this work in India uh, since 2007. And that's just a little about me. Anybody have any questions, any thoughts or ideas? Okay, well, I've got this right here, but again, th this isn't going to be uh, uh, a slideshow that, uh, that is going to be, you know, cast in iron. If you've got a question, you raise your hand, speak up, anything like that. India, just to, by way of review for you all, is a land of 1.3 billion people. Now, that's a lot of people. That is a lot of people. It's the same as the population of China. You know, they're within just a few uh, hundred thousand of each other. China is actively trying to hold their population down. India is not. Now, in India, 35,000 people are going to die every day. That tells you the size of the population because 35,000 people dying every day and the only people who notice it are their families and friends. It's just the normal way things are. That's a lot of people. But in India, over 76,000 people are born every single day. I want you to notice that. That's more than two to one. Now what that means is, is that this massive population in India is ratcheting itself up. And doesn't show very much sign of slowing either. Now, that's interesting if you like statistics. But if you like church growth, that's important. Because what that means is, as the population is growing by birth, not by immigration, but by birth, that means the average age of that population is getting younger and younger and younger. So in India, the average age of a person is 25 years old. Every mall, every village, every school, every store, every bus station, every place you go, young people are everywhere. Largest youth group on planet Earth. Now, that's interesting if you like statistics too, but it's important if you like church growth. Because there are a couple of things that you know about young people. You know, I can tell, you know, y'all are putting a lot of attention into your young people here. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Uh, you know, what you're doing here is not only, this, morning, or this evening rather, is not only helping these little kids, it's also helping the young families who are raising these children. Crucially important. Why? 
Because we all know that young people are generally more open-minded to the gospel and the life-changing message of Jesus than our older people who are set in their ways. Have you ever noticed that? Well, you know, I was 20 years old when I was converted. And, you know, so many youth ministries in colleges and university towns and military towns. That, why is that? Because we all know what I've just discussed. But there's something else you know that you may not have thought of about young people. That is, that young people are very willing to question the traditions of their elders. Have you noticed that? <laughs> oh, yeah. In India, the traditions of the elders, that's Hindu idolatry. Now, that's idolatry with a capital H. I mean, they will worship anything that, you, anything. It doesn't matter if it moves or doesn't move. It doesn't matter, only does it seem to exist, because it doesn't have to really exist. They'll worship rocks, trees, sticks, stones, stumps, you name it, lakes, ponds, creeks, hollows. They'll, they'll worship clouds. They'll worship, you know they worship cows, right? Okay, but not only that, they'll worship snakes and pigs and, and monkeys and every kind of animal you can imagine, they'll worship it. And the Hindu young people, are really seriously questioning this. So much so that uh, this next little number, if that doesn't make you excited, you need to go to a doctor. Over 14,000 Hindus per day are leaving Hindu idolatry and embracing Jesus. Now, when I say embracing Jesus, you know I'm using that in a broad brush stroke, broad term, because the denominations are every bit as active over there as we are. But I want to ask you a question. How would you like to do mission work in a place where over 14,000 people per day are deciding they want to hear the message that you have come to teach? How would you like to do that? You are. I hope you're starting to get a little chill down your spine for the good that you have been and are for the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world of sin and death. Does anybody have any questions, any thoughts, ideas? All right. I can't be sure where to put my fingers because every place I go, they have a different remote. Which one is this? <laughs> the work that we're a part of in India with the Churches of Christ basically began in the 1960s with a guy named J.C. and Juanita Bailey. They, I mean Myrtle Bailey. Uh, you know, I have a friend of mine who's J.C. and Juanita, so J.C. and Myrtle Bailey. They uh, are Canadians, or were Canadians, of course they've passed since, and they began that work uh, as being Canadians. They could come to India freely, they could stay very long times. Uh, we Americans have always been restricted in that manner, uh, and so the work in India began with them. Now, this map kind of shows a little bit of where they, they were. Now, you see New Delhi up here, that's the capital. Mumbai up here, that is the uh, biggest city, well, I should say it's the most well-known city in India, it used to be called Bombay. This city of Kakanada, however, is where J.C. and Myrtle Bailey began to do their work. It's where they did most of their work. In fact, so much so that to this very day, among the churches of Christ, 80% of United States missionaries and 80% approximately of United States mission dollars that go to India's work go and are working there. Now, they're doing a very, very good job. It's very needful. There's a lot of people there. So, But what happened was this, that J.C. began to recruit people to help him with the work, and one of the ones he recruited 
was Dean Crutchfield. Dean began this work in 1967. Well, Dean had an idea, and the idea was based on what Paul said in Romans, where he wanted to preach the gospel in places where it hadn't been preached before. So Dean concentrated on putting the gospel mission work in a lot of other places in India, and a lot more than just that. And just think of the effectiveness that that has. Because you've got a small circle here. Well, how much is it touching? It's only touching that small amount. As the circle grows, the amount of space that that circle is touching begins to grow exponentially. And that's exactly what is happening in India because of the choices that Dean made all those years ago. Does anybody have any questions or ideas, thoughts? Well, uh, this right here is a graphic that, the, that shows you the locations where we, us, have located gospel preachers doing the Lord's evangelistic work. And in many of those, there's more than one. Uh, now, you know, you hear me say the word we. I really, really hope that you hear it the way I mean it, because... I'm a small part of this India mission work. You're a small part of this India mission work. Many congregations, many individuals are a small part of this India mission work. But together, the Lord is using our parts to make a massive difference in the world of sin and darkness. Anybody have any ideas or thoughts? Well, Dean continued what J.C. was doing in that he recruited other workers. One of the workers he recruited is Dale Foster, whom you know well, just lives right down here in Cypress City. Dale began working with Dean in 1985. Now, I've been working in India since 2007, my full-time work, and I've given you my background a little there. Well, Dean was well aware of me. I live uh, where I live currently is uh, probably about two and a half hours from where he was from, up uh, just on the Tennessee border with Kentucky, uh, you know, on the western area. Well, uh, Dean realized his health was declining, you know, and so he felt like he needed someone to replace himself. And But he never really actually, he talked to me, several other brethren too, he never actually pulled the trigger until the Lord had taken him home. And so when that happened, the elders asked Dale, because of his long association with this work, to take over, uh, and Dale said, yes, I'll do this on an interim basis till we find someone to actually replace uh, Dean. And so that was about two and a half years ago. Uh, I've known Dale longer than that, uh, of course. I've known Dale for quite some length of time. But uh, anyway, so that's uh, the next guy they brought on board is... Uh, me. <laughs> any comments, any thoughts, any ideas that you'd like to know? All righty. Well, uh, what time do I need to call this quits? I noticed you've got... You leave at 7. Okay, you leave at 7. <laughs> now, I noticed your clock back there is heedy I worked a long time on getting that clock. <laughs> First work I ever did, the congregation had a building about this size, and they had a clock about that size back there, but they had a clock right here, and it was 18 inches in diameter. I mean, in, in, in uh, well, yeah, diameter. <laughs> so, uh, used to have a brother named Yarbro. He would stand up uh, whenever I went a little overtime, and he, he would stand up and back and literally do this. <laughs> anyway. Let's kind of go a little further. Your work right now that, you know, I say your work, our work, right now, currently, uh, we are uh, monthly supporting 189 gospel preachers and their family to do the work. That past, that previous graphic that, you, that I showed you. We're currently supporting monthly 79 widows and six orphans. In addition to that, not monthly, but as needed, we are also helping an additional 191 preachers with their families. 
345 widows and an additional 82 uh, orphans. Does anyone have any thoughts or questions on this? Statistics are very simple, but every one of these are human lives that you're making a difference in. Now, these orphans particularly, uh, they used to be, when Dean started, he built these orphanages, orphan homes in particular places, but the Indian government in recent years has made that impossible. In fact, uh, you know, in his last years, Dean was dealing with that uh, as a problem. And so what we have done, what Dean started and what we're continuing, is he uh, moved these children out of these uh, in-home facilities, you know, where it's the one compound, one place, uh, like we think of a children's home, and he put them out into the villages, into the homes of individual Christians. And so our support to help these orphans now goes to those congregations to be given to those families to offset the expenses of raising these orphans, raising them in a community, in a home, in the church into the Lord's work. Any thoughts? Yes. Well, full-time, by, by, by supporting these six full-time, I mean, we're sending something to those particular families every month. Uh, we are sending things to these 82 families as they need it, as the local preacher says, hey, you know, there's a need here for this, a need here for that. Does that kind of get to your question? Okay. Any other thoughts or ideas? Well, before we decide to hit 7 o'clock, let's talk about another aspect of the thing. I'm going to skip this part right here. Uh, you know, thanks, Cornelius, and skip that. Uh, one of the important things is, you'll see it kind of grayed out, that's because I create this on Apple and you're using uh, uh, what Windows and it didn't stop where it should have stopped, but just read the gray that you can't read. The key to an effective mission work. The basic key to an effective mission work and that we do is we do what Paul did, okay? First thing, Paul did not work with a single congregation as that's where he worked. You couldn't say Paul is the preacher of X church. Because Paul worked with an awful lot of congregations, and that's how we do the mission work over in India. Now, I know that India is a special situation. It is unlike any mission field anywhere else on earth. It is almost identical to the cultural context of the New Testament time. And so our methods are almost identical to what Paul did there in the New Testament time. He worked with many congregations. But he didn't just do the work alone. Uh, Paul, we call it four T's, me and my, my co-workers, we call it the four T's. First T, he went out and he taught the gospel. And see, because what we ever really, I mean, mostly have in our mind, Paul went to this town and he preached, 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 preached. And then when he, you know, got finished that, he'd move on to the next town and he would preach, 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 preach. And that's kind of how we think Paul did it. But when you read the book of Acts and you read some other letters in the New Testament, you begin to realize that's not really what he did. When you start looking particularly at Acts 19, where Paul goes to the city of Ephesus, you'll notice there that Paul preaches, just like I suggested right there, but after a few weeks, you'll notice in verses 7, 8, 9, and 10, in those area, that little area right there, where Paul separated some of the brethren and began teaching them in a school that was owned by a guy named Tyrannus. What is he doing? Paul is recruiting and training workers. That's what he's doing. Now, you think how important this was in the New Testament, in Paul's work. Think about this. There are 11 named co-workers in the New Testament, and I'm sure there are more who weren't named there because or we just don't have all the letters. Now, that's important. Because now what Paul did when he would train these people in Ephesus and other places, he didn't give them a pat on the back when he finished the training and said, you know, God be with you, go where you'd like to go and, and you know, just do the work. That's not what he did. He did the third T, teach them, train them. Then he entrusted them with a, an important work in the kingdom 
but he didn't let go of their hand. It was like he, we're familiar with the concept of an intern, right? We're con familiar with the concept of a, a, an apprentice, a mentor, and protege. That's exactly what he did. You can see this if you notice 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul says to Timothy, I left you in Ephesus in order to, and the next five chapters are the mentoring. When you look at Titus chapter 1, he says, I left you in Crete in order to, and then the next three chapters are the mentoring. And it's interesting to notice that Ephesus was not Timothy's hometown, and Crete was not Titus' hometown. If you look at 2 Corinthians now, chapter 2, along about 10, 11, 12, you'll notice there that Paul is concerned about something he'd heard about Titus. Paul goes to Troas looking for Titus. Now, he doesn't find him there, and it bothered him so much that he left Troas and went looking for him again somewhere else. What's he doing? It is this trusting, and trusting them as a mentor-protege kind of a relationship. Now, after Paul had taught them the gospel, after he trained the workers, after he entrusted them for a while as, as a mentor, the fourth T, he turned them loose. And that is how the first century church converted the idolatrous nation of Rome. And that is how the 21st century church is converting the idolatrous nation of India. Are you starting to get a chill down your spine now? You starting to feel good about being a part of this? You need to go to the doctor if you're not. Does anybody have any questions or comments or thoughts? Okay, well, I'm going to kind of just, uh, if you don't mind, you can just, uh, uh, right, you can kind of uh, just blank that out, please because I'm going to stop the, the presentation at this point, since you're going to leave at 7, right? Um, now, I mean, you know, the thing of it is, is that I always have more to share with you than I have time. I mean, that's just the way it goes. There's nothing, nothing to do about that. Um, I, I, the last thing I want to talk to you a little about is that little flyer that you've got in there. What that flyer is about is about translatable Bible teaching. We've got to find a way to ground the thousands of these Christians that we are converting. And we've been working on it for years. We've been training preachers. Now, the preacher training we do is continuing education. We don't run a school of preaching. You know, because there are literally hundreds of schools of preaching in India of various qualities. But what there is not in India is any kind of of a continuing education work going at all. Now, just think of yourself. These kids who come out of the schools of preaching, why do you bring them in, and, and the college, Christian colleges, why do you bring them in as interns? Because we all know, just like Paul knew, that once you finish school, you are not finished. Continuing education. And so that's what this is about. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of very good gospel teaching videos available in English. But the problem with them is, is that all of them are English teachers teaching Americans. So they're English speakers speaking to English speakers. And for the translators overseas, whether it's Africa or anywhere else, but in India where I, you know, obviously I'm focused, that is a nightmare for their translators. Our translators over there are not professional translators. They are gospel preachers who are committed to the work and committed to the Lord, and they're doing the best they can, but we can't. They, they're just not professional translators. So we, as the teachers, have to take that into account with the vocabulary we use, the pacing we use, the references. You know, I may talk about fishing in, in India because Jesus talked about fishing, but I don't talk about bass fishing. You know why? They don't know what a bass is. 
that's the kind of thing that happens. And so what this program is about is taking good American teachers on video and editing those videos in such a way that they become effective for teaching local preachers classes in India, no matter what language it is. All of these videos are in English, and the reason they are is because we work in 17 different languages in India. 17. Now you think they, they all speak English, but they all speak English at a very low level. They can talk about selling cars, they can talk about you know, running computers, but they can't talk about things like redemption, justification. Can't talk about those deep uh, religious, emotional, philosophical ideas uh, about which the gospel is, you see. And so that's what this is about. And so if you can, please take that brochure home, read it, pray about it. If you can help us with it, please. The, the most of the cost in this project is actually paying the editors to do the, 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 the very time-intensive work it takes to turn a, trans, a, a normal video into this translatable Bible teaching kind of thing. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Well, let me tell you, I thank you very much for the support that you have been giving us. I want to ask you to please continue that support. If you can find some way to increase that support, I'm not asking you to take away from any good project you're doing at all, but if you can find a way to help us more than what you are, please do so. It will absolutely be used well. There's no place on, in, on, on the globe where there is a greater harvest, where there are so many people who really want to hear the message that we have to share. Last time, any other thoughts or ideas? All right. Do you want to extend the invitation, or would you like me? Okay. Well, let's put up the uh, invitation song on the screen. Uh, at this point in our services, we always extend an invitation. And the reason we do is because if you have never obeyed the gospel of Jesus, if you're ready to become a Christian, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you're ready to repent of the sins in your life and are willing to confess your faith before men with your mouth, if you're ready to be immersed in water, baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, we want to help. By the same token, if you already are a Christian and you have sin in your life, you need to repent of that sin. And if you'd like us to help you by praying with you about that sin, by praying for you about that sin, we want to help. And in fact, if there's any situation in your life at all and you want us to pray with you about that, you want us to pray for you about that, we want to help. But the problem is that no matter how much we want to help, if we don't know, we can't. And so we have this invitation song at all of our services to make a convenient time that you can let us know how we can help. So now, if we can help you in any of these ways, please come forward, let us know how we can help, while together we stand and sing. Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling today. Calling today, why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today, Jesus is called. Is tenderly calling today. Jesus is calling the weary to rest. Calling today, calling today. Bring him thy burden, and thou shalt be blessed. He will not turn thee away. 
calling today, calling today, Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. All right. <clears throat> used to, you know, like doing this sometimes at work, you know, just hanging it on my face. So, <laughs> all right. We're going to keep some of those brochures here. So for those of you who are online and if you want to pick one up or get one or possibly, I guess we can mail one to you. Uh, anyway, so we'll have some of those. We are glad you're here this evening. Um, please continue to pray for the Ashman family, for for little Hampton. Um, he was born yesterday, and he's two pounds and eight ounces, so he needs lots of prayer and lots of strength and growing. So uh, please continue to pray for uh, Dwayne Mann and Dave Dietrich and uh, little Kai Brown as well and our expecting families um, and a, a prayer of thanks for uh, Roy and Devra Wooten. That's uh, Dean and Paula's uh, son and daughter-in-law that they are no longer COVID positive. So we need to be thankful for that as well. Don't forget we do have Bible classes online with Zoom. I know Wednesday night's uh, classes are going through uh, Joshua. Make sure I got the right book there. <laughs> All right. So anyway, and that's been really good. I've really enjoyed the Zoom Bible classes a lot. It's been, I think it's been it's a different format, but, you know, I'm in the comfort of my home, but it's, it's, um, and I can see people's faces, you know, and it's been really good. So I enjoyed that a lot. So, um, if you're here, just, you know, say hi to Dave Nance and Dave, I really appreciate, uh, you being here this evening. So <clears throat> it's, uh, I was kind of curious to get your comment about, they know about computers, but if, if you ever talk to somebody in India, it's kind of, Hard to understand them. They're English. They they know English, but how well do they really? It's not their. That's it, you know. So anyway, uh, makes a lot of sense. Let's uh, have a prayer together as we are dismissed. God in heaven, we are just thrilled once again to worship you and help our lives to be lives of worship, in everything that we do and everything we say and even everything that we think. And and God, we know and you know that's. That's a challenge for, for us. Uh, sometimes we, we don't do very well at that, but we long for your uh, forgiveness and we long for your grace and we know that you provide it and we are assured of that. And we thank you so much for that blessing that you have given us through your son, Jesus. Uh, dear God, we want to thank you for uh, <clears throat> Roy and Deborah Wooten that they are... Uh, that they're on the mend. We want to pray for Kai and Dave and Dwayne as they're getting uh, improving. And we want to pray for uh, Hampton Reeve, that you give him strength and help his little body to grow and uh, just help his development to be uh, normal. And dear God, we know you can, you can do that. Uh, dear God, once again, help us this week as we step out of these doors and as we go to work and as we talk to people and help us to shine the light that is Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.